Hello, good day. Let's continue our reading and commenting of various texts. And today I'd like to comment on Plato's Mino, which I'm sharing in front of you right now. The Mino, uh, Plato's dialogues, uh, provide an excellent introduction to philosophy. And I chose Mino, one of Plato's early dialogues, because in many ways, it's the perfect place to start in understanding his thought. Plato, who lived 427 to 347 before the Common Era, was one of the many young persons in ancient Greece who admired the philosopher Socrates. During his lifetime, Socrates attracted a circle of followers who were interested in philosophy. They enjoyed hearing Socrates discuss philosophical problems during the course of which he would often refute the ideas of persons who were supposed to be authorities on a variety of topics. The established rulers in the city, politicians, religious leaders, and others presented themselves as experts in specialized areas of knowledge. As such, these persons, Socrates assumes, must understand the concepts required by their trade. If they are judges, they must understand the concept of justice. If they are priests, they must understand the concept of piety. If they are artists, they must understand the concept of beauty. As the promising young son of a wealthy aristocratic family, we are told, Plato was really expected to undertake a career in politics. Plato, however, wanted to become a playwright and to write tragedies for national competitions. Later on, especially after Socrates' trial and execution by the city-state of Athens, especially on Trump charges, Trump up charges of corrupting the youth and failing to respect the city's God, Plato turned increasingly to philosophy and eventually started the academia. Plato's academia was a model for modern universities that existed for about 700 years, longer, in fact, than any other institution of higher learning in history, as far as we know. At the Academia, Plato taught many famous students, including Aristotle, and wrote dialogues that are somewhat like philosophical plays in which Socrates appears as the main character who is also a moral and intellectual hero. Socrates, as we know, never wrote a book, nor essay in philosophy, at least none that we know of. Socrates was primarily interested in the idea of virtue and of what he refers to in Plato's dialogues, like the Alcibiades, as the care of the soul. Contemporary modern translations can speak about it as cura personalis or personal care. We are fortunate 
in that while we have lost many classical writings, such as the voluminous, voluminous manuscripts of the pre-Socratic materialist thinkers, Democritus of Abdera, and even some of Aristotle's works, all of Plato's known dialogues and many of his interesting letters have survived to the present day. The result is that we have in Plato's dialogues not only an enormously valuable resource on Plato's thoughts, offering us a picture of the life and the ideas that were present in ancient Athens, but also gave, gives us a peek of Socrates' philosophy. Plato's portrait of Socrates can be cross-checked uh, by the writings of other contemporaries such as Xenophon in his dialogues and other authors in antiquity which provides the life and work of Socrates as a morally dedicated, faithful thinker whom many commentators until continue to regard until now as the foundation of Western philosophy. Typically, in Plato's dialogues, and as we will see as we explore further Mino, Socrates confronts a fellow Athenian somewhere in the city, most often in the agora or marketplace, for example, or on the steps of the law court, and there begins to engage the person in conversation that quickly leads to the painstaking examination of a concept. Socrates buttonholes these suspecting individuals, and after a series of questions, and a particular style of criticizing his interlocutor's replies convinces them to reject or at least rethink their views. Eventually, Socrates was brought before the law because of his doing philosophy. And we learn a great deal from Plato's descriptions of those events. When Socrates was put on trial to his life, he remarks that his practice of engaging in dispute was in fact inspired by respect for the gods. I suggest you also try to explore my commentary on the Apologia. As we all know, he was indirectly told by the voice of God of Apollo at Delphi you know, uh, that he was the wisest person in Athens. It's not really oraculum. You know, uh, Father Roque Ferriols, the Filipino Jesuits, doesn't actually think it's an oraculum because an oraculum means a tiny voice. And if it is the phoniteo, if, if it was the voice of God who really spoke to his friend, Cherophon, it cannot be Tiny. I think there is a point there. With typical irony, Socrates didn't accept that pronouncement of the God of the of the voice of God in Delphi, but only if it is interpreted as meaning that he knows that he does not know, while other claims to know things that they really do not know. And Socrates explains that in order to prove that what the voice of God said was true, he proceeded to question others to see whether or not he was wiser than anyone. Socrates' day in court, as we know, is portrayed in Plato, Plato's and Xenophon's dialogues, both entitled Apologia which means defense. Uh, this is quite contrary to the understanding of apologia right now as remorse or a request for forgiveness or pardon. 
Socrates, we soon learn, is completely, completely unrepentant about his philosophical challenges to the pretensions of established thinking. When he demonstrates that persons do not always know what they claim to know or are supposed to know, Socrates admits that he may have inadvertently encouraged idle young men in the city to associate with him for the sheer sport of seeing their elders refuted, which is probably one but not the only thing that eventually got Socrates into legal hot water. Raising philosophical doubts about what other people claim to know evidently contributed a climate of hostility and dislike not only personally but also among the most powerful in the city. By maintaining that he has practiced his confrontational method of dialectic in order to verify the pronouncement of the god Apollo, Socrates sought to avoid direct responsibility for corrupting the youth of Athens and to show that far from failing to respect the gods, his life of philosophical inquiry has been devoted to their service. An interesting subtext to Socrates' trial and execution is the fact that Socrates was an avowed opponent of democracy on philosophical grounds. We, and by democracy, he does not, of course, refer to democracy as we know it right now. That's quite not it. We see Socrates' critique of democracy explored in Plato's Politeia, or the Republic. Socrates, as Plato represents, argues that democracy as rule of the many, or the hoi polloi, is one of the worst forms of government. The many can never have the specialized native ability and training to qualify them for the most important offices in ruling the ideal city-state. The comparison of Socrates is fond of making is that we would never choose the opinion of the hoi polloi or many who, were merely, who merely have untutored opinion versus the one who knows if we were in need of serious medical attention. Would we prefer the judgment of a large body of persons from every walk of life and ask them to vote whether or not we should have an operation or that of a or consult a professional qualified physician? Socrates assumes that any reasonable person would base such an important decision on the wisdom of the one who knows versus the many who have many different inadequately supported opinions. The many are also more generally influenced by emotion and fleeting impressions, which should not be allowed to determine decision-making in a manner as important as physical health. Should we not then apply the same principle in deciding who should rule the city-state? and have responsibilities for the political health of all citizens. Athens, which had just gone through a period of upheavals in which its democratic institutions have been threatened, overturned, and only recently restored, saw in Socrates' teachings a real and present danger to its love of democracy. In this regard, some scholars have speculated that the main charge made against Socrates of corrupting the youth may not have had so much to do with publicity, publicly arguing down 
any of the city's respected citizens, but more specifically because of his well-reasoned criticism of democracy and his advocacy of government by the aristocracy. Similarly, with regard to the indictment that Socrates fails to honor the city gods, one of which is believed to have been a goddess personifying democracy. Whatever the historical reasons for Socrates' tragic end, his decision not to flee Athens but accept death sentence reported in Plato's dialogues The Crito and Phaedo was as much a defense of the life of philosophy as of his own circumstances. As a believer in the immortality of the soul, as we find also in Plato's dialogue, which we will consider now, Mino, Socrates regards his death as a freeing of his soul from its imprisonment in the human body. He expresses no regret about the court's decision and offers the jury no opportunity to avoid the consequences of issuing his death sentence. Plato's dialogues are normally divided into three categories, the early, the middle, and the late. Although the principle of division is somewhat controversial, and there remains disagreement about which particular dialogues belongs to which period, many scholars accept this framework and the historical analysis behind it. The early dialogues are thought to be Plato's first effort to transcribe conversations in which Socrates actually engaged. This includes Eutyphro, Apology, Crito, Phaedo, Symposium. The Middle Dialogues continue to feature Socrates as the main protagonist, but begin increasingly to involve more and more of Plato's more own ideas, for which Socrates eventually becomes more a spokesperson and literary foil. Writings from the Middle Period prominently include the Republic, probably, or the Politeia, probably Plato's most famous and arguably most important dialogue. The latter period of Plato's work is distinguished by dialogues in which Plato's ideas predominate and Socrates as a participant in discussion is limited to a minimum. Characteristic examples of this one is the laws which is unfinished, and possibly the Timaeus. One clue to the placement of any particular dialogue is the extent to which topics involving mathematics and science, uh, in which Socrates himself, as opposed to Plato, seems to have little interest, begin to take precedence over topics in which Socrates is believed to have been more deeply concerned. Virtue, ethics, morality, political ideas, the nature of beauty, statics, good, and the care of the soul. I chose Mino as the dialogue to comment on, and I know you've been looking at the title page since a while ago, because here Socrates makes use of a distinctive form of argument known as the Socratic elencus. The Mino offers a classic example of its applications. Socrat Socratic elencus involve a chain of reasoning and a distinctive mode of inquiry in which there is an exchange of questions and answers between two speakers. The elencus can be divided structurally into six stages, although not all instances include all six ingredients in the same order. The following are the basic components of the elencus. One, 
a question is posed about the meaning of a general philosophical concept. The elencus begins with a problem about what is meant by the concept of virtue, justice, beauty, piety, or the like. So there's a question. Second, Socrates' interlocutor tries to define the concept by advancing a number of instances or examples that are believed to fall under the concept. Efforts to provide this type of definition can be seen in a proposal to define the concept of beauty by listing out, for example, beauty in art, beauty in nature, beauty in mathematical proof, and the like. Or even more specific cases such as the be a beautiful person or a beautiful artwork. Third, so the interlocutor, instead of providing concepts, provided, provides instances. Third, Socrates rejects this type of definition by examples as having the wrong form, objecting to its effort to explain a general concept by means of particular examples. Standardly, the problem with the definition of this type is that it does not provide an analysis of an underlying concept. Trying to define a general concept by means of specific cases reverses the priority of conceptual analysis. Here we have no reason in that case to agree that any of the examples provided are actually instances of the concept under or until we know that what the concept means in its general terms. Thus, we may have no justification to agree, for example, that these or that style of art or particular artwork is beautiful. Fourth, next Socrates' interlocutor comes to understand what is required in a correct definition of a general concept and attempts to provide a definition of the form that Socrates would approve, offering to explain the general concept in approximately general terms. At this stage, if the decision were about the concept of beauty, for example, uh, as whatever delights the eye in art can be given, which leads us to the fifth point. There, Socrates refutes the interlocutor's general definition by giving counterexamples. Counterexamples are cases that satisfy the concept to be defined, but not the conditions of the proposed definition, or that satisfy the conditions of the proposed definition, but are not instances of the concepts to be defined. So if the concept is satisfied by the condition of the proposed definition, then the definition is said to provide at most necessary but not sufficient conditions for the concept. If the conditions of the definition are satisfied but are not instances of the concept to be defined, then the definition may specify sufficient but not necessarily conditions for the concept. In either case, the proposed definition is inadequate, as a counterexample is meant to prove. A counterexample to the above definition of beauty as whatever delights the eye in art is that it fails to take into account the beauty in nature or beauty in music or that matters of beauty that is not necessarily a source of aesthetic delight. A definition of sorts would be said to provide neither necessary nor sufficient conditions for beauty. The definitions, conditions are not necessarily because there is beauty that does not involve visual delight. This leads us to the sixth part, the recognition on the part of Socrates and his interlocutor that after all, they do not fully understand the concept they have been trying to define. The chain of questions and answers 
terminates in aporia or puzzlement. So Socrates says, ironically describes his wisdom as consisting in the recognition that by contrast with others who claim to be experts in the field, he at least knows he does not know. The aporia in which the Socratic elencus culminates is supposed in turn to be the first step towards Socratic maiotic meiosis uh, me, meios, meiotic Socratic meiotic this is a program of moral self-recovery that can only begin with the acknowledgement of ignorance and the need for personal reform meiosis is the Greek word for midwifery and Socrates, whose mother was a midwife, describes himself as the midwife of the soul, whose purpose is to help others to give birth to an enlightened self. Socratic Elencus, therefore, is at the heart of many of Plato's dialogues. If you want to understand Plato's philosophy, we must be alert to the six stages of the elencus or to the separate stages at least, which are either abbreviated or modified. The Mino, among all of Plato's dialogues, is one of the most pure and complete examples of Socratic elencus. That's why I have chosen it, because we can learn much about Socrates and Plato's thought by considering the course of Socrates' chain of questions and answers. The Elencus is Socrates' dialectical method of arriving at philosophical truths in conversation with other persons whose background suggests that they are supposed to have generalized knowledge of general concepts. By challenging their understanding of these ideas, Socrates hopes to improve his own grasp of the concept of virtue to help his fellow citizens realize the extent and even the depth of their misunderstanding and thereby to lead them towards a path of moral self-recovery, benefiting the city-state directly by contributing to the philosophical enlightenment of its citizens. In the process, unfortunately also, Socrates manages to make a number of powerful enemies who do not appreciate having their ignorance of things known publicly that will lead him to his demise. We will look at this edition of the Oxford World Classics and focus only on the first one, the first dialogue, Mino. And uh, slowly, we will start, so it's on page 97, uh, we, we will look at Mino uh, and there, uh, and we will try to analyze uh, Mino. Uh, so please get your copy of this text and join me as we read and comment on Mino.